Hi, Monique here. If you like this kind of information, consider joining my Patreon group. You have level one where you get lots of written posts, tips and tricks, supplement information. Level two will get you a two or three day menu plan so that you can eat low oxalate and do it with confidence. And level three will get you the whole live Patreon Zoom where you get to participate and ask questions. So enjoy the video and check me out on Patreon. So then I started digging a little bit deeper into this whole business of how could oxalate be affecting the nervous system? So you don't see researchers looking at secondary hyperoxaluria, so diet and supplements and those kinds of things. That doesn't tend to be looked at unless it's a catastrophic poisoning. So I've seen case studies on people who decided that they were going to have, there was one in particular, I should say, where uh, a man decided that he was going to eat a more ketogenic diet and he started having a lot of kale smoothies and he was eating a lot of nuts. Long story short, he got very sick, but these are always treated as one-offs. There's something about the person that put them in the path of oxalate because either they didn't have good kidney function or this is the one case study I'm thinking of that I just mentioned, the man was a diabetic. So you've got some kind of compromise going on. But Honestly, if oxalate can deposit, I'm going to hypothesize that it doesn't matter where it's coming from. Once it's in the body, we're going to have oxalate having the capacity to deposit, particularly if oxalate's bound to calcium, because that's very easy to precipitate out. That's why we know about kidney stones. So in severe oxalate overload, where somebody has systemic oxalosis, which is more likely if they're dealing with primary hyperoxaluria and their body's building too much oxalate. What we see in those cases, though, is that you can have deposition of oxalate in the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. So that's what CNS and PNS stands for there. Anecdotally, an ER doctor that I know who's in India has done some scans with people who are coming into the ER, and he also has managed to do some scans on his fellow doctors. And one of his colleagues was eating some outrageous amount of almonds a day. I don't know, it was a pound or something. It was something ridiculous. And he actually said to this colleague, I want to do a scan of you and I bet you I'm going to be able to find oxalate in your brain. And didn't he come up with a scan where they could see calcifications? Well, they could see some kind of plaque that had been dropped down that was obviously solid in terms of what the scan showed. So short of doing, you know, a dissection on the brain, you're not really going to know exactly what what it is until you open somebody up. But there have been research studies which have dealt with people who had Parkinson's where they had permission to do autopsies after those people had died and where they found calcium oxalate plaque in the brain. So we've got these key case reports. We've got some neuropathy data, usually based on people being able to get permission to do some of these kinds of tests after someone's passed away. What we know for sure is that it's possible. What we don't know for sure is how rare it is. So without more autopsy data from people who have Parkinson's, for instance, you don't know how bad it is or how frequently it is that these people have calcium oxalate plaque in their brains. So I'm going to kind of put together an argument for why this would be potentially more often than we think that oxalate might actually be causing irritation to the brain. But this is one of those places where I'm kind of hoping researchers will start to have some curiosity because if they've found oxalate in the brain for uh, Parkinson's patients, who else could also have this kind of issue? Especially if you've got somebody who's been trying to eat an extra healthy diet, blah, 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 so that their oxalate intake is higher than you'd like. Okay. So I did try to figure out what mechanisms might be at work. So how the oxalate could be affecting nervous system tissue. So you do have the whole crystal deposition, which is going to cause essentially a mechanical disruption. You've got something which is blocking function of tissues. You could also have, because of the data from 
the Cleveland Clinic and this issue with finding calcium oxalate and arterial plaque, you could have the microvasculature, especially in the nervous system. So where you have the possibility for TIAs or things like that, you could have those kinds of things going on in the brain. Absolutely. You could have tissue inflammation because we know that oxalate, particularly as a microcrystal can stimulate the inflammasome. That's that N. LRP3. And that's the cell's ability to turn on inflammation. And I'm going to argue that we're seeing these big things in catastrophic kinds of situations like primary hyperoxaluria, but what's happening below the threshold of severe primary hyperoxaluria. So there's, I think, a good argument to be made that there's possible subtle accumulation, which we would not see and which would be hard to determine without things like autopsy data and some kind of tracking. So we have some evidence gaps, but we have what I'd argue are emerging signals. So we have the most evidence from severe disease. That's where we are looking for it because the person is already quite ill. We have kind of mixed more hypothesis generating data for neurodegenerative disorders in general. So, you know, I'd argue if you've got it turning up in Parkinson's, could that be part of dementia? Could that be part of Alzheimer's? We we don't have enough information here. We do know there's certain kinds of plaques that are developing in the brain, but, you know, is there some kind of trigger? Is there an inflammatory trigger? And so there's, I think, room for a lot more exploration here. And the unknowns, because I'm really supposed to be talking about oxalate and stress and cortisol is that we've got some unknowns here in terms of adrenal involvement. We've got unknowns, obviously, in threshold dose, like where's the risk start? Not really sure. I certainly have questions about subclinical burden. I don't think there's some sort of hard line someplace. Well, I ate this much oxalate or I took in this much oxalate. And so that's where the problem starts. There's all sorts of toxins which are doing more subtle things below uh, either a disease threshold or a lethality threshold. So I think there's some definite places where we can do more exploration here. And my other question is really about intervention outcomes. So if you had somebody who was developing Parkinson's and then you put them on a low oxalate diet, would they get better? And that's like a big question right now. And it's a big question for a lot of conditions where we might be now very suspicious that oxalate's involved, but do we really have more than anecdotal information about what happens when we reduce it? Most of what we're doing right now, I would argue it's paving the cow paths. We don't know a lot and we're learning as we go.